So welcome everybody to the um, Managing Your Health seminars. We've got the Gut Health Workshop today uh, with Min, Nicole, Michelle and Hannah, um, as well as their supervisor, Amelia, from the UC Nutrition and Dietetics Clinic. It's a really great presentation. I'm really excited for you all to see it. Um, I'll start off um, with an acknowledgement of country. So HCCA would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of and custodians of the land on which we meet. We respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city in this region. We pay our respect to their elders past and present. And we would also like to acknowledge any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Um, so today, my name's Darcy, I'll be the facilitator, but I'll mainly be handing it over to our great presenters today in a minute. Um, we also have Iva Penne, Penne, who will be kind of monitoring the chat. Um, so feel free to send any direct messages to her if you're having any troubles. Um, she can help you out on tech today, um, or you can message me as well. Um, but yeah, it should be a really good interactive event. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So as I mentioned, we'll be monitoring the chat. Um, please mute yourself. Um, it's just makes it a bit easier and we've got a few presenters today um, so they'll be jumping in um, you can turn your video off if you like um, it is great to see everyone's faces if we can but um, I will just note the meeting is being recorded so if you don't want to appear in the recording feel free to turn your camera off or um, just pop things in the chat instead um, I think that might be it just really there's no such thing as a silly question um, there's some great points in this presentation today um, for you to ask questions but if you're feeling like you're going to forget and something pops in your head feel free to put it in the chat um, and we will get to it as we go along um, yeah we'll also be running a few polls tonight so they'll pop up in the chat as well um, so hopefully you should just be able to click that and it'll be nice and easy um, but otherwise feel free to just pop your answers to any questions in the chat as well. Um, yeah, I think, is that all, Penny? Shall we get started? Perfect. All right, I will hand it over to Min to start the presentation. Thank you, Darcy. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. So uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to attend our webinar today. My name is Ming. And I'm joined by Nico, Michelle, and Hannah. We are on final year student dietitians at the University of Canberra. In this webinar, we will be talking about how gut health can affect your overall well being. This webinar is a part of the Managing Your Health series hosted by the Healthcare Consumers Association. This has been, yeah. Thank you, Michelle. So in 45 minutes, we will be covering the following key topics, the importance of, the, of a healthy gut to our general health and well-being, uh, the relationship between the gut health and other health conditions, some easy way to maintain your healthy gut, and lastly, we will finish by wrapping up and answering any questions have come up after the presentation. So let's do a warm up activity first. What do you think about the roles of dietitians? What do, uh, what do dietitians do? You can turn on your mic or chat in the chat box, it's up to you. Uh, <laughs> maybe people are a bit shy. No one? <laughs> Okay, I think maybe take your time and I will mean, explain a little bit about the roles of dietitians. So in summary, dietitians. Um, oh, thank you, Nadia. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Give nutritional advice. Yeah, oh, we yeah. have some answer here. Yeah, hmm. yeah. nutritional advice, um, provide advice for healthy eating habits as well. Yeah, thank you, Owen. You are all correct about 
what dietitian do. So in summarize, dietitian try to understand, uh, understand the relationship between food and health from their enhancing community's well-being. This could be in the form of managing daily eating for people affected with health conditions such as diabetes, overweight and obesity, cancer, heart disease, gut issues like constipation or stomach pain, the list is go on. So we provide uh, genetic education about nutrition like this webinar. We also provide one-on-one -on -one consultation to collect information about your health and your diet. From there, develop what interventions most appropriate for your case. For example, if you experience constipation or diarrhea for days, then you could come and visit us. We will discuss with you to investigate the reasons why and find solutions for you. So it's good to have a healthy gut. But hold on, what is the gut? So on this slide, you can see the simple structure of the gut uh, and the functions of each part. The gut system consists of uh, six main components. Firstly, we start with the mouth. Yeah, we gave Michelle. Yeah, thank you. The mouth will break down food into small pieces and uh, swallow these pieces into the esophagus tube. Esophagus it trans uh, transports this um, piece to the stomach. The stomach will store and mix food with digested enzymes. And when the mixture is ready, it will be moved to the small intestine. The small intestine is where most of nutrients will be absorbed here, like carbohydrate from our bread or pasta, protein from meat, fat from oil, water from food or vegetables, and vitamins from all entire food. Uh, whatever remains in the small intestine will be moved to the large intestine, where the large intestine will absorb remain water salt and prepare waste to remove out the body. Anus will store and push the stool out the body when the anus is full. There's another really important component in our gut that I want to mention is microbiome. Microbiomes refer to billions of tiny living things or you can call them bacteria. They mainly live in the large intestine. The compositions and variety of bacteria in our gut is unique to each of us because uh, our family genes, environment, medication, and our diet will influence the type and amount of gut bacteria. A healthy microbiome is one with a wide variety of good bacteria and uh, also the one, the one where the good and bad bacteria are able to coexist without problems. A healthy microbiome brings benefits to our body, such as ferment undigested food to release good substance for our body, is including some anti-cancer substance. All bacteria also have to produce vitamin K for our body. In later parts of this presentation, my fellow students will share with you in details what we could do and eat to take care of our gut bacteria. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So in this slide, I want to emphasize why we all need a healthy gut. Because a healthy gut is where on the nutrients that our body needs when we digest and absorb. And of course, our body needs this nutrient to survive. The brain and the gut communicate with each other every minute to maintain the balance inside our body. And uh, the gut is also the first barrier of immune system to detect and destroy any organisms causing disease that enter the body. The stomach is the, uh, is the superhero here as the acid environment in the stomach will kill uh, these uh, organisms. Also, a healthy gut will reduce the risk of us having health conditions such as uh, weight gain, cardiovascular disease, diabetes and gut issues. As I mentioned earlier in the next slide, um, Nichols will talk more about these functions in detail. 
So just a quick checking. Do you, does anyone have any questions so far? Maybe not yet. Okay, so now I will hand the presentation to Nico. Thanks, Min. So I'm going to briefly touch on the link between gut health and health conditions. Um, so it is very important to remember that how we each experience a health condition will be different. So if you do have any specific health concerns, you need to seek advice from a medical professional, such as your GP, and get some personalised advice, which will meet your individual needs. So following on from what Min has just spoken about, our gut is involved in many of our body's processes. So as you can imagine, it can also be linked to many issues that occur within our bodies. The main processes our poor gut health can really have a noticeable impact on include our metabolism, which is the process of how our body turns what we eat into energy, the gut-lung axis, which is essentially a pathway between the gut and the lung, the gut-brain axis, our immune system, and our heart. So over the next four slides, I'm going to touch on some common conditions that can be related to the health of our gut. So first up, we'll quickly look at mental health, which is related to our gut-brain axis. So the gut-brain axis is the two-way communication system between your gut and a brain, and this is through a nerve called the vagus nerve. So our communication can be physical or it can be chemical. A classic example of physical communication is having butterflies in your stomach when you're feeling anxious or nervous. And the types of bacteria living in the gut also impacts our communication. So some microbes produce short-chain fatty acids, which are a healthy substance friendly bacteria make when they break down the foods. And these short-chain fatty acids have been associated with lowering anxiety levels. So our chemical communication occurs through neurotransmitters, which are just messengers in our nervous system that carry chemical messages around our body. So examples of chemicals and hormones that use these neurotransmitters to send messages to the gut from the brain include serotonin, or our happy chemical, which is found mostly in the gut, GABA, our calming chemical, which has receptors in both the gut and the brain, and dopamine, our pleasure, motivation, memory and mood hormone. And this one is actually produced in the gut. So any disruptions to our gut microbiome can actually change the type of bacteria in our gut. And this can then reduce our short chain fatty acids, as well as reduce the amount of serotonin, GABA and dopamine, which reaches our brains. This can result in low or poor mood and increases in anxiety, depression and any other mental health conditions. So your gut bacteria can also affect your weight through a few different ways. So the first one is through digestion. So as Min mentioned, your microbiome influences how food is digested and absorbed, and it can also influence how dietary fats are stored in your body. So your gut bacteria also digest certain antioxidants, which are found in plants, and these are known as flavonoids. So these antioxidants are substances that help protect your body from damage, and they may also help prevent weight gain. Another way is through hormone regulation. So your body produces a number of different hormones that can affect your appetite, including leptin, which is your satiety or I feel full hormone, and ghrelin, your hunger hormone. Some studies have shown that different bacteria in the gut can affect how much of these hormones are actually produced and whether or not you feel hungry or full. As we learned earlier, your gut produces your pleasure hormone, dopamine. So discretionary foods such as chocolate, these trigger the release of dopamine, activating the reward center in our brains. So the behavior is reinforced. This can help explain why we keep going more back for more of that block of chocolate, the one you just can't seem to put down. Another weight-related hormone for both men and women that can be influenced by our gut bacteria is estrogen. So if our microbiome becomes disrupted, our bodies can start producing or circulating too much or too little estrogen, which can then disrupt our metabolism and change where we store body fat. So high levels of estrogen are more likely to cause fat deposits around the arms, buttocks, thighs, and breast, while too little estrogen causes fat deposits around the abdomen, stomach area, which can then increase the risk for other diseases linked to obesity, such as type 2 diabetes or heart disease. So immunity is super important for our overall health, especially as we're moving through cold and flu season, and to avoid the dreaded COVID-19 virus. So around 70% of your immune system resides in your gut and our immune system and our gut bacteria work together to create our body's first line of defense against invaders, preventing harmful bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites from living in our guts. 
So our gut bacteria talk to our immune cells and they train them to identify dangerous invaders like a virus and not to attack our friendly bacteria or even our own body cells and tissues. So if the health and diversity of our gut bacteria declines or it's out of balance, this can really throw our immune system out of balance as well. We want our immune system response to be, so it's going to spring into action if we get a cold, but we don't want it to go into defense mode against something like, say, a new food. Um, and, you know, if, if our back, gut bacteria goes out of whack, it uh, throws our immune system out of whack, this can result in your immune system not working as it should. And you may see a worsening or developing of chronic inflammatory diseases, such as asthma, endometriosis and diabetes or even an autoimmune condition, which is where your immune system attacks things it shouldn't. So as we get older, the diversity of our gut bacteria, it naturally declines, and this can impact our immunity, which is why we might not be able to fight viruses as well as we used to, and it also makes it even more important to look after our gut health as we age. So as I just mentioned, 70% of the immune system is actually in the gut, and the types of bacteria in our gut can influence other areas of the body. And this includes the pain and inflammation we feel in our joints. So a recent study has found that some types of bacteria, such as streptococcus, release toxins into our gut, and this can cause inflammation. So the inflammation can then cause the immune system to start attacking its own cells and cartilage in joints like the knee. So researchers think that the inflammation caused by the toxins may speed up the development of diseases that cause joint pain, like osteoarthritis, regardless of whether someone suffers from obesity always been putting a lot of pressure on their joints. A faulty immune system is also responsible for common types of inflammatory arthritis, including gout and rheumatoid arthritis. So once again, this reiterates why it's so important to have a healthy gut microbiome to keep your mind, weight and immune system healthy and also your joints pain free. Okay, everyone, so check in time again. I appreciate it. I just went through a fair bit of information in a short period of time. Does anyone have any questions about what I've just spoken about? a bit quiet tonight just yeah. waiting for the tips in the next section I think <laughs> oh now hand over to Michelle and we can start those tips off no worries all right thanks Nicole so now that we've covered uh, how gut health can impact your overall health and health conditions Hannah and I will be discussing some eating tips and tricks we can do to improve our overall gut health so let's get started so there's a lot of information out there, and we also just said quite a lot as well. It can be quite overwhelming. So how do we get the right balance of bacteria and other microbes in our gut for good gut health? So gut health isn't only determined by what we eat and what we drink, although we will talk about this in a moment. Specifically, we'll touch on what a healthy diet might look like, and we'll focus on how our fruit and vegetables and also fiber can encourage good bacteria. Other lifestyle and environmental factors, such as physical activity, pre and probiotics, hydration, and stress can also affect our gut health. So firstly, I'll talk about how diet can affect our gut health. So the first tip we have is to have a healthy diet with a diverse range of foods. So on this slide here, I have the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. This is a food selection guide, which visually represents the proportion of the five food groups recommended for consumption each day. So these key food groups include your fruit, your vegetables, grains and cereals, particularly whole grain and higher fiber. We've got your lean meats and proteins, and this also includes eggs, legumes, beans, and tofu. And then the fifth one is dairy, and we're trying to aim for reduced fat options. So along with this guide, there are recommendations on the number of serves of each food group. Some of you may have heard of the two fruit and five veg slogan, and this is where it came from. So since there are hundreds of different species of bacteria in your gut, they all require different nutrients for growth. So generally speaking, a diverse microbiome is considered healthy since there is more species of bacteria to gain the multiple health benefits from. So think of your gut microbiome as an orchestra that works together. Just like how you can't have an orchestra just made up of violinists, your gut microbiome can't just be made of one type of bacteria. You need that variety with different types playing their different roles, but working together. So unfortunately, as some of you may be aware, the traditional Western diet is not very diverse. 
So we might just open up a poll now and I would love to hear your opinions or thoughts on how many Australians aged 18 years and over you thought met the recommendations for both fruit and vegetable intake. So we've got a few percentages up there. So again, the question is what percentage of the Australian adult population met both their fruit, so the two serves and the vegetable intake, the five serves uh, in 2020 to 2021. So the first one there is five to 10%. Second one there is 10 to 30 percent, 30 to 50 percent. And the last option there is more than 50 percent of the Australian adult population meeting both their fruit and vegetable intake. I'll give you all a few moments to have a little read through. Um, and yeah, I can't see the poll results, but if um, you can let me know. Yeah, <laughs> so it looks you. like we have a pretty clear winner with um, 10 to 30 percent, um, followed by 30 to 50 percent. And then a few people have also thought it might be 5 to 10 percent as well. But no one has put down more than 50 percent. So little faith. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks for all of you who participated. Um, Good hunch, uh, definitely not more than 50%. So in this 2020 to 21 survey, um, only 6%, so that five to 10% options, option A. So only 6% yeah, of the population met both the fruit and the vegetable recommendations. Um, in addition to these statistics, there was 45% of the Australian population who just met the fruit recommendations, so the two serves of fruit each day. And then only 9% met the vegetable recommendations, which was five to six serves of veggies, depending on your age and sex. Um, but yeah, good job, everyone. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, uh, eating a diverse range of foods can lead to a more diverse microbiome. With different types of bacteria in our gut, we get different types of their benefits. So gut bacteria need fiber to flourish. So the more fruit and vegetables you can consume, the better. So on this slide here, I have the recommended daily intake of the vegetable and fruit food groups. For the majority, it is recommended that you have between five to six serves of vegetables. And this might sound like a lot at first, but one standard serve could be one medium tomato, one cup of leafy salad vegetables, or even half a cup of cooked veg. And this could even be corn or peas. We're trying to aim for variety. And there are so many vegetables to choose from. And the more colors, the better, as this indicates a wide variety of nutrients, so your vitamins and your minerals. Some tips to increase veg intake could be adding some to soups, in adding some to wraps, or even bulking up a sauce. So for everyone, the average of two serves of fruit a day is recommended, and this can look like one medium fruit, so an apple, a banana, or orange, uh, two small fruits like apricots or mandarins, or even just half a cup of berries. We want to try and limit fruit juice, especially pulp free and just to occasions, as most of the fiber is in the skins of the fruit and it's easier to overconsume fruit in this form. Adding fruit to plain or sparkling water is also an easier way to bump up our intake. So one of the main reasons we're trying to encourage more fruit and vegetables in your diet is because they're often high in fiber. And this leads on to our third tip, which is to try and increase your fiber intake. Fiber is the part of foods that isn't digested and it can help you feel fuller for longer. A key role for fiber is it provides prebiotics and prebiotics are the non-digested part of food that feeds the good bacteria in our gut. Fiber is essentially the main food source for the good bacteria living in our gut and this allows them to grow and support our body functions such as your immune system, hormone production and overall gut health as Nicole mentioned earlier. A lack of fiber in your diet can also limit the amount of nutrients your gut bacteria get, and therefore they can't perform these benefits mentioned earlier. So the current recommendations are shown on the screen, with male adults aiming to get about 30 grams of fiber each day, and for female adults, this is 25 grams. A 2018 review stated that in Australia, only 60% of children and 70% of adults met these recommendations, and less than 20% of adults met the suggested dietary target, which is on the bottom of the screen there. And this target uh, is to reduce the risk of chronic diseases. So how can we slowly start to introduce more fiber into our diets? 
Fiber is mainly found in the plant foods, especially whole grains and high fiber cereals. So think of your Sultana bran, all bran, plus fiber, wheat bix, even oats. Plant foods include your fruit and vegetables, as I keep barking on about, and these can be fresh, frozen, and dried. Nuts and seeds or legumes and lentils are also high sources of fiber. So we've got some tips uh, on the screen on how you can increase your fiber intake, and that includes choosing whole meal or whole grain varieties. So this could be switching your whole grain, or even multi-grain breads, swapping to brown instead of white rice, or choosing whole meal noodles and pasta on occasions. You could also add some fresh or dried fruits to cereals and in this colder weather, maybe on your porridge. Adding some nuts or seeds are great sources of fiber as well if you sprinkle them on top. You can also swap out some of your typical snacks for those higher in fiber. So high fiber snacks include fresh fruits such as mandarins and kiwi fruits, which are in season at the moment, raw vegetables such as celery or carrots with hummus is great. Again, handful of nuts or seeds and even wholemeal crackers are other good options. Again, trying to uh, emphasize that if you're having fruits, try and leave the skins on the fruits, except the mandarins and kiwi fruits, which I just mentioned, um, and also the vegetables as this is where most of the fiber is. Uh, and then reading the veggies in your sauces and soups. So if you have stew or casserole style dishes, you could try and swap out some of the meat with lentils, beans, chickpeas, or other vegetables. Um, I do want to say it is best to increase your fiber intake gradually and over a few weeks, because so, this allows for the natural bacteria in your gut to adjust to the changes. Think if you were a colony of bacteria that suddenly got your food intake doubled or tripled within a few days, you'd probably get quite overwhelmed, might feel a bit bloated, a bit crampy and gassy, and that's how the bacteria and you will feel. So on this slide here, I have done a little comparison between some typical pantry staples on the right with their higher fiber counterparts on the left. So as we can see on the top here, wheat bix has eight times the amount of fiber compared to a cup of rice bubbles. Whole grain bread has double the amount uh, as your white bread, and this is just from the standard Woolies home brand one. Peeling potatoes can also remove up to 40% of fiber. Um, so yeah, this slide just has some of our suggestions on increasing fiber intake by swapping current foods in a diet. We aren't trying to add more foods or completely eliminate them. But these are just some swap ideas. So looking at this slide, I would love for you all to write down on a piece of paper next to you or on your device that you're joining from uh, one potential swap you think you could do to increase your fiber intake. Uh, just one swap is plenty. You can use one of the swaps written here or even think of your own. Uh, and this could range from swapping your plain muesli bar for one with fruits and nuts or all the way aiming up for that five serves of veggies each day. Um, and I'd also love for one of you all or more uh, to share one of the swaps you've come up with. You can turn on your microphone or pop it in the group chat. This time, we're not going to move on until someone puts something in. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, potato skin is a really good one. Pulse pasta instead of white pasta. Yeah, great. Thank you for putting something in, for contributing. Um, I will now hand over to Hannah, who will be discussing our remaining three tips to improving your gut health. Thanks, Michelle, and hello, everyone. So another way that we can look after our gut is by eating a diet full of pre and probiotics. So prebiotics are plant fibers that act like a fertilizer to your gut, stimulating the growth of healthy bacteria. They lay the groundwork for probiotics to come in and do their thing. As Michelle said before, prebiotic foods are rich in fiber, such as whole grains, legumes, beans, and fruits and vegetables. So if you're aiming to eat foods high in fiber, chances are you're eating foods that are also high in prebiotics, which is great news for your gut. Where prebiotics act like a fertilizer, probiotics are the flowers in which the prebiotics help thrive. Probiotics are foods that contain live bacteria that make their way down to your gut and help keep your gut microbiome that we spoke about earlier nice and healthy. Probiotic foods include um, uh, yogurt, some cheeses and fermented foods such as kimchi, miso, kombucha, sauerkraut or kefir. So as we can see in the little graphic above, some of the prebiotic foods we have as well is onion, 
soybeans, asparagus, bananas, leek, some breads, artichoke, and garlic. Um, and some probiotic foods that we have are some aged cheeses, bit of chocolate, kefir once again, uh, the sour cream, miso soup, pickles, probiotic milks, or yogurts. To help our guts function the best they can, we need to keep our bodies hydrated. Drinking water throughout the day helps break down and digest foods, prevent constipation, and regulate bowel movements. And those are just the benefits for our guts. Staying hydrated has so many other benefits for our health as well. Also, if we are increasing our fiber intake, which Michelle just touched on before, it's important that we increase our water take with this, as fiber works best in our bodies when it's consumed with water. So now we're going to do another little poll. Um, this poll will be on how much do you think is the recommended water intake for adult men and women per day in litres. <laughs> so we have 1.5 for men and 1 litres for women, 2 litres for men and 1.5 for women, 2.5 for men, 2 litres for women, and 3.5 for men and 3 litres for women. So I'll give you just a sec to submit your answers. I'll just wait a moment or so. All right, so I can't see the poll answers, so I might. See... I will end the poll and oh, I'll thank you. share the results, but um, we do, yeah, everyone's very quick tonight. Um, we definitely have a winner. So 2.5 litres for men and two litres for women. Um, yeah, close behind that is two litres for men and 1.5 litres for women. Um, and then we have one person thinking 1.5 litres for men and one litre for women. And then no one for the last option again. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, so good job, everyone. So most of the people got it right. So yeah, the recommended is 2.5 litres for men and two litres for women. It's recommended that adults drink at least a minimum of 1.5 litres. So if you are someone who can find it harder to get their recommended daily water intake, maybe it's not a drink of preference for you, there are many ways to get your water intake that don't just involve drinking water. So for example, you can drink herbal teas, you can eat fruit and vegetables with a high water content, such as watermelons, cucumbers, capsicums, lettuce and tomatoes. Um, and you can also add a bit of flavoring or cordial, um, cordial to water if that helps. Um, to increase your hydration, make water your first choice of fluid over drinks such as um, juices and soft drinks. These drinks can still have a place in a healthy diet. However, water should always be the first choice. Stress can also have impacts on how our gut functions. Stress can be experienced in many different forms. Psychological, such as anxiety, fear, frustration, and sadness. Sociological, such as family, financial, work, birth, or death. Biological, such as medical pain, allergies, and aging. Environmental, such as noise, temperature, pollution, and physical, such as excess exercise or surgery. So there's many different ways that we can experience stress. And as you can imagine, sometimes some or all of these can be impacting us at the same time. As Nicole touched on earlier, stress can interfere with our gut-brain axis. And when we become stressed, there are a number of things that can be happening in our body, particularly in our guts. The above picture shows a nice little outline of some of the things that can be happening in your gut when you're in a state of stress. In a nutshell, stress puts our body into a state of fight or flight. And when our body goes into a state of fight or flight, it puts us into a survival state, delaying processes that aren't necessarily needed for survival, such as digestion. So when our digestion process is put on the back burn, the processes in our stomach are slowed down, which can result in decreased nutrient absorption, nausea, constipation, diarrhea, cramping, indigestion, and heartburn, all those nasty symptoms. So stress can also cause inflammation in our intestines and can even make the barrier in our intestines a bit weaker, which can lead to our gut leaking bacteria into our body. This is normally fine as our immune system, as Nicole spoke on earlier, comes along and it helps clear this out. However, you can imagine when this is constantly happening in our guts, our immune system can get a bit tired of constantly helping, um, helping which can in turn lead to chronic gut issues. 
It is important to try and find strategies that help you when you feel stressed. So this can differ from person to person. It could be meditation, mindfulness activities, talking with family, friends, counsellor, journaling, adequate sleep or exercise. Everyone has their own um, management methods when it comes to experiencing stress. Similarly to stress, there are a few other things that can negatively impact our gut health. Medicines and antibiotics can change the amount and type of bacteria within our microbiome, which can change and even potentially damage it. Some medicines, including antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, and laxatives, this doesn't mean we shouldn't take these medications as they can be really important and even crucial at times, but it is good to be aware of how they can impact our gut and what we can do when we're taking these medications to try counterbalance the damage that they could be doing, such as taking pre and probiotics with them, particularly with those antibiotics and taking all those steps that we spoke on previously, such as um, staying hydrated and increasing our fiber intake. Next, a diet high in ultra-processed foods can interfere with our gut-brain axis and cause inflammation. Ultra-processed foods are foods that can be high in salt, fat, sugars, artificial sweeteners, and other chemicals and preservatives that extend the food's um, shelf life. These can be foods such as takeaway foods, commercial baked goods, pre-packaged foods such as chips and lollies and soft drinks. Due to the processing nature of these foods, they can be high in bad microbes that can ultimately affect the healthy bacteria that's in our microbiome. Uh, next, excessive alcohol consumption can also cause inflammation and affect our gut lining, meaning that other substances in our gut can cross, uh, cross into our bloodstream, particularly toxins. Uh, furthermore, it can overall impact our microbiome and it can make it harder for our digestive enzymes to break down food when we eat um, as it impacts the gut liver access that Nicole briefly spoke on earlier. Another um, negative impact on our gut is artificial sweeteners, which are synthetic um, sugar substitutes. Um, they can be used in sachet form, like in the image above. You might have seen the equals and splendors. Um, which can be put in coffees and drinks, baked goods, um, or they could already be in pre-packaged products. Artificial sweeteners can alter the gut microbiome and subsequently lead to our body not being able to break down um, the sugars in our body as well as they should and can build an intolerance and disturbances to our metabolism. They can create an imbalance in our, our gut microbiome, sorry, <laughs> and even cause gas and bloating as they aren't very easily digested. Lastly, poor sleep and exercise can lead to poor bacteria diversity and increase inflammation. When we sleep, we're allowing our body to rest and digest. The body gets to have a break from all the busy things that we've been doing throughout the day. However, when we don't get adequate sleep, this can put our body into a state of stress, which as we know from our stress, stress slide does not make our guts feel very good. Uh, moreover, studies have shown that when we exercise, the beneficial bacteria in our gut increases by 40%. That's huge. So moving our bodies also helps to keep things moving through our digestive tract, regulating our bowel movements. So the key takeaway messages from these past two slides on the negative impacts is to maintain a healthy gut, particularly if you are someone who can have gut issues, um, to try and limit intake of ultra processed foods, alcohol and artificial sweeteners, and try to move your bodies with exercise and get good quality sleep. So our last check-in. Um, this one's going to be a little bit different. So um, we have two lists here, one for positive impacts um, on our gut and one for negative impacts on our gut. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the react buttons in Zoom. Um, there should be like a thumbs up and a thumbs down option, or you could do um, so a thumbs up for positive impacts and a thumbs down for ne negative impacts, or you could do a smiley face for positive or a frowny face. Oh, sorry, what was that one? Uh, could I repeat the bit about the 40? Yep. Yeah. So um, when we exercise, uh, the beneficial bacteria in our gut increases by 40%. That was found in a recent study. Yeah, so for the activity, I'm going to um, say some statements and I'd like you guys to let me know if you think that what I say will be a positive impact for our gut or a negative impact. Um, you guys can give those a go now if you want to before we start, just to make sure that they all, all work. And hopefully we can see them on our screen. 
If we can't, you could do them in the chat if you wanted to. Do the reactions work for? I think I'm seeing a lot coming up, so that's really good. Um, oh, okay. Fiona, we, we can probably chase up that study and pop it in the email um, we yeah. send out later. So, yeah, we can get that to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can't see them on my end, but I'm hoping everyone else can see the reactions on their end. Um, so the first statement is um, increase fibre intake. Would that be a positive impact or a negative impact? We're good. seeing a lot of positives on that one. Can you see them now? Yeah, 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 I can. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, eating diverse foods from the five food groups. Yep. Good job, guys. Um, stress. Yep. Nice work. We'll try and do it a little bit faster if we want. Um, artificial sweet, um, artificial sweeteners. Nice guys. Um, eating foods with pre and probiotics. Yep, good job. Poor sleep and exercise. Yep, um, alcohol. I'm loving seeing all these reactions. Great job, guys. Um, yep, so alcohol is a negative. Um, medicines and antibiotics. Great job. Um, eating variety of fruits and vegetables. Yep, perfect. Only a couple more. Um, staying hydrated. Awesome. And our last one, a diet high in ultra processed foods. Yeah, seeing lots of all those reactions. Thank you guys for participating so well on that. I know that we just spoke on these things, but it's nice to kind of solidify that information once we talk about it. So nice work. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to the next slide. So what can gut issues look like? So gut issues differ from person to person and everyone experiences them at some point. Symptoms can look like constipation, diarrhea, nausea, stomach pain, cramping, gas and bloating, reflux and indigestion. So like I said, we can all experience these from time to time. However, if you feel that you experience these often or if you feel like they could be causing you discomfort often within your lifestyle, it could be really helpful to head to your doctor as a starting point to get, get checked out for any kind of gut issues that could be at play. If there are any gut issues at play, a dietitian can also help you to identify what kind of factors could be involved with these symptoms, identify foods that could be triggering and help manage these symptoms. So try and tune into your gut. When or if you experience these symptoms, it could be really helpful to write down the symptoms. What you ate prior to the symptoms, how your mood was around these symptoms. Were you feeling stressed at the time? Were you feeling calm? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, if you could have been taking any new medications, did you eat a bunch of takeaway? It's good to try and get as detailed as you can. And by writing these down, you may start to see a pattern with your symptoms and any triggers. And that can also be really helpful when you go and see a health professional because they can help you kind of find those triggers as well. So to summarize, and thank you for all being so patient with us, um, <laughs> our guts can be a really complex thing, but by eating a healthy, varied diet full of those foods, high in fiber, um, like our fruit and vegetables, high in those pre and probiotics, by keeping our bodies hydrated and keeping them moving with exercise, reducing our stress levels and our intake of ultra processed foods, alcohol and artificial sweeteners, we can keep the microbiome in our guts healthy and can even prevent diseases. Um, and if you would be interested in seeing a um, student dietitian, the UC Nutrition and Dietetics Clinic offer a great service at affordable rates. So it is a student-led clinic where you would be seeing master's students dietitians such as ourselves um, that offer individualized dietary advice, comprehensive nutrition assessments, and a body composition analysis. Uh, feel free to jot down the contact details above if you're interested in booking an appointment.
So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? We've got plenty of time at the end now to have some questions. So yeah, feel free to put them in the chat or you can turn on your microphone. I was also just going to say we can send these details through as well. Oh, thank you. I do have one to start us off while everyone else is thinking or maybe typing in the chat. Um, I was just thinking about when you were discussing um, this was Michelle, but I'm sure it's for everyone. Um, adjusting your fibre intake and trying to do that slowly. How does that work when people are kind of switching from a plant-based diet or going pescatarian or vegetarian um, or even going the opposite direction and going from a vegetarian diet back to meat? Like, is that something that really plays into fibre and that should kind of be done a little slowly or gradually? Sorry, um, do you mean if someone is moving from a, like a going towards like a vegetarian diet, if they were originally eating meat and like how yeah. that would go? Yeah, or the other way around even. So is that kind of something that should be done quite gradually rather than just sort of waking up one day and cutting out everything and really switching the diet up? Um, I think it's easier to do it, like I would probably recommend doing it slowly. Um, I think even when people go full veggie after eating meat all of a sudden, um, their body can sometimes kind of go in, not not like a bad reaction, but I think like their gut can sometimes be a bit um, crampy or they're just not used to, I guess, going from vegetarian to eating meat. I'm speaking on like my own story. Um, but it's a big change and I feel like it's better to slowly introduce it. And I guess it's, um, I mean, the other students can also pitch in, but I, I think it's just it probably less, uh, not confronting, but it's, I can't think of the right word, but I think, yeah, just slow introduction is probably better, just easing your body into it rather than suddenly like an abrupt. Um, shock to the fiber. system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, shock to the system. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone wanted to add anything else to that. Yeah, just to add to that, if you did want to say or need to swap straight away from, say, an omnivore diet with your meats and that to a plant-based diet, you can also do it a little bit more gently by having some of those sort of those white breads, white pastas to start with and then gradually build up for your fibre because they do have lower levels of fibre. It's probably less likely to upset you straight away and then slowly over the next few days or next few weeks, you can start sort of introducing some of those multi-grains and more fibre-rich foods. So it's not saying you can't do it, but as Michelle was saying, if you do it too quickly, you might have that bit of shock to the system and your body. You, you just don't have the bacteria which know how to break down those things. You need to build up the bacteria over time and they do take a little bit of time to multiply like anything. So you could do it. I would probably recommend obviously sort of a lower fibre to ease you in, like all your whites and that and then slowly build up your multigrains and your whole meals, all those sorts of good fibres. Perfect. Thank you both. That's really great. Um, we also have in the chat um, a bit of a question about medicines and antibiotics and how they impact negatively. Um, but we also have a bit of a question about what about the medicines that can actually rever reverse things like constipation and diarrhoea? Um, how does that kind of work with the gut health and how do we sort of classify medicines when it comes to that? Does anyone want to give that one a go or do you want me to say something? <laughs> I think maybe you, Amelia, Philly. <laughs> no worries. I think um, one of the things I'd say is that we as dietitians work very closely with doctors and um, we make, uh, it's really important that we, um, I guess, respect what a doctor's ordered as well because they obviously have that insight into the, the medicine side of things. 
as well. And there can certainly be instances where taking um, those medicines are important. Um, of course, yeah, they do impact our gut because that's where they have their effect. Um, but sometimes they are needed. And I think uh, I think it was you, Hannah, that touched on that. Or was it someone else? Sorry, Nicole. Anyway, but um, yeah, they're um, definitely, um, if a doctor has ordered it, I would um, certainly, um, if you're concerned, speak to the, the doctor about it and see if, if you have particular concerns tell them and um and yeah they they should be able to work with you as to what an alternative might be if that's not working with you in your gut so yeah thank you um we have another question in the chat this one's sort of more about um anti-inflammatories and how they can kind of aggravate our gut a little bit so looking at turmeric um, and magnesium for arthritis um, are there maybe any tips for how to integrate those things slowly or to make them a little less aggravating to the gut so my biggest advice for this one is if you are going to try a new supplement and it doesn't specifically say do not take with food the probably the gentle approach would be to have something to eat with it. So that way your bacteria you've already got there has something it knows how to break down and process. And that way you're probably less likely to get diarrhea or the upset stomach. But also in saying that sometimes some medications just don't agree with certain people. So it'll be up to your, your own gut. Um, and especially if it's something you haven't had before, you may not have the right bacteria in there just yet to be able to break it down and do it without any of those symptoms. So it's not saying you can't try any of these things, but if you are going to try something new um, and it, like I said, it doesn't specifically say take by itself or, you know, before food, I would probably have something to eat with it just to ease yourself in. And then maybe later on down the track, if you feel like, okay, say like the turmeric is no longer giving me any issues or, it, you know, I don't feel like it will be giving me issues then you can try to take it by itself if, if that's what you'd like to do. Yeah, also um, bouncing off with Nicole, another idea, like depending on if your turmeric is in like the capsule form, if you're just having it as like the powder, um, you could try distributing it out throughout your day. So I know that if you uh, exceed a certain amount of turmeric consumption, it can cause quite a lot of um, like digestive issues. So um, like reflux is one of them, diarrhea is another, and even just like bloating. Uh, if you have too much turmeric um, in one go. So yeah, another if you you could have it with your food, but you could also try and distribute it out through the day if you're having it in a controllable amount. That's a good idea. Could have it in teas or in curries and kind of space it out a little. The other thing you could do as well is that um, just thinking of the magnesium, magnesium supplements are known to give you diarrhea um, for quite a lot of, quite a number of people. Um, I guess you could also try and have um, foods that are rich in, in magnesium as opposed to a, a supplement. So that could be another option. What are some foods that are rich in magnesium? I think I need some tips on that. <laughs> Anyone know off the top of their head? Um, I think on the top of my head, it's mainly your like, it's, I'm pretty sure a lot of foods would have like healthier fats. So like your avocados, I'm pretty sure uh, nuts, particularly like Brazil nuts, maybe and almonds. Um, and we love a legume. So legumes as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are the ones I can think of on the top of my head. But if anyone else has any others that you can think of. Fiona suggesting maybe bananas. Uh not that I know of, but probably. I don't know all of the foods. <laughs> My personal favourite for magnesium is dark chocolate. So it's very, a couple of squares of dark chocolate is actually quite good for magnesium, but try to get the 70% uh, or higher a nice dark bitter chocolate. I think also like the dark green leafy vegetables, such as like your spinach and whatnot, they're a really good source of magnesium.
So I think it's one of the easy way for you to identify magnesium in food that food contain fiber and high in fiber when uh, have uh, magnesium too, like vegetables, food, nuts, legumes, and grains. That's a good tip. I think we're all still thinking, so I might jump in with another question that I had. Um, and this is probably really for everyone, um, but maybe the presenters first um, or anyone in the chat or if anyone wants to jump in. Does anyone have some tips for some quite affordable ways to get a diverse diet? I know when I was a student, I found the best way to do it was definitely to go to the market and get all of the veggies in all of the colours I could that were being thrown out on a Sunday um, and also getting a lot of canned food. So the sort of legumes and lentils and chickpeas and all those kinds of things um, was a good idea and making my own hummus and things like that. But yeah, I'm not sure if anyone has any other good tips for that because sometimes it can feel a little overwhelming to be getting kind of all of those colors and really healthy things can be a little expensive, especially at the moment. I guess one of the biggest tips I have at the moment is don't be afraid to use frozen vegetables. These days, your frozen vegetables are snap frozen. So it's not like back when it used to sit on a shelf for a couple of weeks and then they go, oh, it's about to go off or freeze it. It's actually just as nutritious as buying fresh. So the price of fresh vegetables at the moment, I would probably be more inclined to go for a frozen version if one's available. And you can get quite good mixes as well these days. So you don't have to buy sort of three or four different vegetables and only use parts of them. So you can actually get your carrots and your broccoli and your corn and your peas and all that already pre-mixed for you. So you don't really have to think about just how many vegetables you need to buy this week. It would, would just go back to the um, rich in magnesium. Julie just said um, they Googled and avocado, spinach, almond, bananas were suggested as rich in magnesium. Thanks for Googling, Julie. Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, another tip, so Nicole kind of stole mine, yes. Frozen veg and fruit is great. Um, as a current student, yeah, utilizing um, Sunday markets, so fish week markets, I, it's like a tradition of mine that like around three to four o'clock, I usually just like walk around, do my laps, and they usually have like produce that isn't bad by any means, but they're trying to get rid of it because they're not going to reopen until Thursdays. So they're really nice to also see what's in season, what's somewhat cheaper. Um, and just walking around, there's normally like a bag of like onions for like a dollar, for example, or a bag of like um bits of broccoli that are like a bit uh squashed or something but they're still great in like a soup um and looking at catalogs um so Coles and Woolies on Mondays after 5 p.m they release like their catalogs for like the upcoming weeks of any sales or specials and you can go online and you can check uh, and I usually like to just see what's on special that week and then buy whatever fresh produce is cheaper they normally try and advertise like yeah this is half price and then you kind of get you into the habit of knowing what the average price of foods are in terms of fresh produce when they're in season um and it's kind of good because that you know when they're a lot cheaper and you can kind of know and go before they sell out or all the stocks are empty and then final tip sorry um Aldi or Aldi however you want to call it is also underrated in my opinion it's also pretty cheap in comparison to Coles or Woolies um yeah that that's my tips <laughs> I love that tip I'm a very big LD fan <laughs> especially for basic cans and things I think it's really great yeah. oh we do have a hand up did you want to jump in hi hi my name is Aineen Yusuf I have issues with fried food uh I'm quite I mean Adelie <laughs> about over 70 and does that mean that my gut health is bad uh, every time I have fried food like chips or fried fish or schnitzel uh, I avoided it as much as I can and I felt bloating and you know horrible pain and 
troublesome. So I avoided it if I can, but sometimes in company, I just at all might as well. And then of course I go home and suffers. So uh, how, do you, how do you manage that? Is that because my gut health is very bad? Does anyone feel comfortable just to maybe talk about some common gut irritants that um, cause these sort of symptoms in most people or can cause them in? Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, so fried foods is actually quite common for a lot of people. So what can happen is if you have too much fried food um, and your body's not producing enough what's called bile, which helps break them down in your stomach, it can actually go into your small intestine and cause a few issues there. And that's where you might get some of the gas bloating and diarrhea. Um, it is very, very common. Um, and as obviously as we age, our body doesn't produce as many of the enzymes or the acids that we need to break down certain foods. So that's why you know, as we age, we can have a few more issues with things, especially fried foods. Um, spicy foods are another thing which a lot of people can have issues with as well. Um, but it's just important to remember that there can be other underlying conditions which you might not have had previously, which can sort of pop up as we age. And reflex reflux is one of those really common ones, um, especially with stomach acid. Um, and also, if you haven't eaten for a while, sometimes you get very, very hungry and you've got to build up a stomach acid. So if you do eat something um, spicy or even something really fatty, it can actually cause you a bit of stomach discomfort um, purely because you've had too much stomach acid sitting in there. Your body hasn't had anything to digest over the last however many hours it might have been since you've last eaten. Um, and that's potentially why some people, especially with big breakfasts or oily breakfasts, sometimes have some issues. Um, is basically their stomach had nothing to work with before that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I also, I'm just going to add like a small little thing as well. Um, high, like if your meal has a lot of fat in it, um, fat normally slows your digestion down. So if it's like a lot of fried food, a lot of greasy food, they've got high amounts of fat, um, they kind of slow your stomach emptying. Um, and so you can spend more time in your stomach and that can cause also the bloating, stomach pains as well. Um, yeah, just a little tidbit. <laughs> I think um, I was going to say, um, just to summarize what like Michelle and Nicole just said. So I think that it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bad, a bad gut or like bad microbiome. It just means that those processes might um, not, you know, it could be those factors that come into play rather than you not having a very good gut, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily your gut, but what, you know, what could be happening when it comes to digesting those foods. We've also got something from the chat that says um, keeping up um, water and fiber helps with um, with fried food, but also a few small meals instead of three larger ones helps with reflux and um, gastroparesis. Yeah, uh, there is also a, a scenario that um, seeking some contribution when you have a family home consisting of young children who are under 10 parents in their 30s and older adults how or what should the diet look like or reasonable um, good diet to cater for that age age range to satisfy all the all the people in the household So I guess maybe more generally, um, just sort of when you're feeding about feeding a family, um, how should you be sort of thinking about incorporating a diverse diet? Um, should that be different for each person in each age group? Or, you know, how can you kind of combine that together to make life a little easier to kind of get that diversity in for everyone? I can go. I've, I've got a family, <laughs> but um, just a suggestion. I I think, and it's when they were quite little, it was whatever we were eating, um, they would eat as well. And then just I think the sitting down and sharing meals together um, really helped. And 
kids have tried things that we've we that we eat and sometimes don't like it, but then we 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 stop and don't force them and we retry again, um, Nate, and it seems to have worked. So our children have quite a really good uh, range of 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 foods that they they like to eat, and 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 it makes parenting very easy when you can only cook one meal, and that caters for um, the adults and children but it can be it can be quite difficult but I think um, yeah that meal time is really important and having you know sort of yeah letting the kids try things and then stop if they don't want to continue and then retrying those foods at a later later time so just a tip from for there I think one of our favourite meals um, in our household is one where we can pick and mix. So we get our Mexican. Um, I have a child who is not a fan of um, meat and another one who's not a fan of beans. Um, so we do a meat and a bean um, and then they can choose which one they're having and just a whole range of different veg. The adults love their onion and capsicum, the kids not so much, um, but they can sort of pick and choose and they love being able to make that decision themselves as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, but um, I think everything you just said as well is really, um, yeah, spot on is, um, I guess, um, parents can choose um, what and when to serve um, and it's the child's job, I guess, to decide um, if they're going to eat it and how much they're going to eat of it. Um, yeah. We also have in the chat that um, even though the meals together are a nice idea, sometimes that doesn't work for all families. If you have kids that are quite sensitive to that sort of sensory hearing, chewing noises and being sensitive to that, um, to mouth noises and also having limited diet choices um, due to autism. Um, so I guess, yeah, really that kind of pick and choose scenario could be good because you could also eat at different times, but I'm not sure if anyone has any other advice on that one. Yeah, I think also just including, always including foods that you know are safe foods for the child so that they have something there that they feel is safe and is not as daunting to, to try. But certainly, yeah, acknowledging, of course, I'm, what I said was a very generalised sort of approach um, and every family is very different. And so um, I guess, you know, in the clinic we've worked with um, with parents and kids and um, try to work with each individual scenario in those situations. Um, but yeah, great to find those common things. That's great, yeah. Yeah, we have good suggestions of burgers, spaghetti, bolognese with added vegetables, tacos, as we were talking about before. Another favorite one of mine is also pizza because you can kind of put together one yourself as well and cook them separately. Um, that was really good in my family where we had a vegan, a vegetarian, a pescatarian and a meat eater. Um, so that worked really perfectly with the whole spectrum um, and also celiac. So, yeah, I think that one's really good because you can kind of adjust. But, yeah, if anyone has any other suggestions of those good kind of meals that you can pick and choose, um, that can be really great. Um, I was just going to say um, I'm not overly like certain about with the misophonia. I don't know if I'm saying that right, the fight or flight when he hears the mouth sounds, um, but I don't know if potentially maybe doing like some kind of, um, while it probably isn't the most desired option because, you know, family meals, you want to be talking and whatnot, but if he has that potentially utilising like earphones or um, some headphones at the table so that you can still eat together as a family, but he can't hear those noises. Um, I don't know if that could be a potential thing that could help, um, but yeah.
<laughs> top of the range headphones and still needs to be in another room. I do understand that. I can get a bit sensitive to those noises as well quite often. Um, we also have a question. Oh, sorry. One more suggestion. Um, chicken euros and homemade pizza. Hamburgers, really good one we've mentioned <laughs> with music playing as well. Um, we also have what about intermittent fasting? Um, and just kind of thinking about that sort of sudden change to the diet, is that negative for the gut health or? I think about this question is really depend how you apply this intermittent fasting. If you fly fast from around start at 6 p.m. in the day before to about like 7 a.m. in the day after. So it's quite safe to do it, but as dietitians, we do not <laughs> suggest or like uh, do not encourage this any kind of like restrict diet, that makes sense. But I don't think that in the short term it can make any harm to your gut. But if it's long term, then not just your gut and maybe you lack of energy, nutrients, other kind of vitamins if you don't have enough uh, on the requirements that your body needs. I guess also on that, like it depends on how or like what your intermittent fasting uh, diet is. Like if you're still eating healthy foods, then I think that's good. But um, I have friends who are intermittent fasting, but their first meal they have is like French toast and then bacon and then like hash browns. And they, just because they're fasted, they still count as intermittent fasting. So it really depends on what, like I'm not saying that you are, but I my point is that it also depends on the foods you're eating. And I think if you are able to uh, eat good foods and eat foods that are high in fiber, fruit and veg, watching your hydration. Um, I wouldn't discourage that, if that makes sense. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we've also said um, keeping up the fluids when fasting would help. Um, uh, this one's this one's a really good point as well. So when you're taking medication that can suppress your diet as well, which I know can happen with quite a lot of things, um, especially, you know, um, for people with ADHD on things like Ritalin that they will take in the morning to try and focus. Um, even, yeah, other certain like antidepressants that will take away a bit of your appetite. Um, yeah, what are some kind of... <laughs> Um, tips on that of sort of how to navigate that suppression of appetite. This is a tricky one. <laughs> um, we love small and frequent meals. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a meal or breakfast. It could just be, um, you can have a couple of strawberries or just eat small little things that you don't necessarily, or people won't not want to eat because they think it'll make them full or they don't feel hungry. It's just like a small little snack, I guess. Um, so ways that we're trying to encourage people to eat more is, yeah, just having those frequent snacks so they don't have to be big meals that seem quite daunting. Um, just like slowly having a little bit here and there during the day. I'm not sure if that is uh, possible, but usually that's just a bit more approachable, I guess. It doesn't have to be breakfast. It could just be a few berries or have a little bit of this here and there and then just trying to do it regularly. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I was just going to um, suggest, so you said from he fasts from maybe 8 or 9 p.m. I'm not sure um, how old your son is, but potentially bringing back that last meal time. So he's maybe finishing up eating around uh, 7 p.m.-ish. Um, so that can help him um, build his appetite for the morning, I guess, because I guess the later we eat at night, we're less likely to wake up hungry in the morning. So if you kind of bring back that time, um, that eating, that last meal that you have, whether it's dessert or dinner or supper, um, it's building that appetite overnight to try and have that hunger in the morning when he wakes up.
Yeah, yeah. I can appreciate that would be tricky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I guess it's kind of more about changing the expectations. It's not you have to have three meals a day and that's the only way to go about it. Um, really just some food is better than no food and whenever it happens is better than not at all. Um, but, yeah, feel free to jump in if you had anything else to say. I think one story is uh, correct, and there's just another detail to us. Um, with someone really low in appetite, then they can eat like at every two hours. Like you can set the time and you eat at every two hours. So this is another way to improve your intake. Yeah, reminders can be really good when you don't have those sort of hunger cues um, or to also kind of have a a buddy, a housemate or a parent that's kind of reminding you of those things, I think is good sometimes as well when you're really just not thinking about those things. Also, just touching on the last message that's been sent. So if he gets hungry at 2 to 4 p.m., he then eats all evening. That's probably the um, side effects of the medication just coming off then and then your son realizing, oh, like I can have these hunger cues now and I've realized how hungry I am. I'm not eating since the yeah eight or nine p.m. the day before, um, so I know it's difficult. But yeah, encouraging some sort of food intake uh, again doesn't have to be big meals. Just yeah, the small regular ones. Um, I guess kind of having the foresight of like knowing that they are probably hungry, but they can't feel or they can't act on those uh, cues. Um, yeah, so again, the timing or like the reminders on your phone is good ideas, maybe. Um, obviously, you know you and your son best. <laughs> mm, that's a good point. That's We've really great, yeah. Visual reminders as well. So, yeah, I think there are, um, you know, that can really happen with medication as well. So putting it in your coffee cup before you start the day, if that's the first thing you go for. But yeah, also, yeah, that's a great suggestion, putting a muesli bar or an apple or a banana in the glass of water, water or coffee cup, um, just to kind of build it into those rituals. Um, that's a really, really good suggestion. I just wanted to offer, I know we're getting a little close to the end now, so I want to offer to the presenters because we've really had some great questions. Were there any kind of things that have popped up that we didn't quite get to in the moment that you wanted to add or anything you wanted to add to your presentation? Putting you on the spot now, but um, yeah, we've just had some really good chat so far. And also to the crowd, if we have any last minute questions, we definitely have time to answer a couple more if there's something still on your mind. All right, maybe if we don't have any more, we can all go and have a fiber magnesium rich dinner with all of the tips that we've had all planned for next week. Um, that would be really good. Uh, we have a, oh, a suggestion and a question. So um, using Benefiber to keep things moving. Um, but are there also any food substitutes that would work instead of this, like another swap out tip? Uh, food substitutes, not necessarily like the same like powdered form as Benny Fiber, but um again just trying to emphasize yeah just general high fiber foods so your beans and your nuts and seeds and your fruit and veggie with the skin on um I'm not sure if that's answering your question if you wanted like food high fiber food options instead of any fiber
So I'll just add in here, um, one of the things we do see in the clinic, which works quite well for people is LSA. So it's a linseed sunflower seed almond mix, which you can sprinkle on top of a yogurt or, you know, mix into a cake or a cereal. We find a lot of people have really good results with that. Um, and that could be just a nicer way than, yeah, than doing the Benny Fiber. Um, yeah, psyllium husk is also really good. Um, it's essentially the same as a Metamucil. Um, and once again, you don't have to have the orange flavor then and you can mix it into different things. I guess Alrighty. I oh, oh, I got, no, you go. <laughs> I was just uh, saying. Um, I, I just got a suggestion for problem with that. Uh, what I do, as I said, I'm over 70, uh, drink warm water with a bit of lemon, or you can't find lemon, you use uh, apple cider, a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar first thing before you take anything else in the morning. That's what I do every morning. So uh, warm water. I don't know if people can put up with that, but it helps me regular every first thing in the morning uh, with warm, uh, warm water and um, a bit of lemon juice. I don't wouldn't take it and then let it work and walk around and it all helps. So that's my I've been doing for many, many years now and I don't need to take any uh, fiber, anti-fiber, anything like that. Because all those other things make me really cramp up. <laughs> I did, I used to do that when I was pregnant a long time ago. And it just make you have more cramps. And my stomach react to it. So just nice warm water with lemon uh, juice. Or if you run out of lemon juice, just put apple cider vinegar. I don't know anybody would, uh, yeah, that's my suggestion <laughs> from an old person. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure if anyone has any other suggestions to put in the chat or jump in. Actually, in terms of fiber, there is like insoluble fiber, soluble fiber, and resistant starch. If you can balance this, then it will help you with like stones and everything. Like soluble fiber will help you soak in your stool, and insoluble fiber will like buck up it, like buck it up to have it in the form. That's my sense because it's like, again, it's really a big topic and we do not have time to explain, explain everything in detail. But um, if you can use food instead of some kind of supplement, it would be the best. I guess the benefit with um, Benefiba and Metamucil as well is that when you have it, you normally have it in a drink. So you're already having a cup or a glass of water. Um, and that kind of relates as well to what Hannah was mentioning before, like hydration is so important for your gut health and keeping things regular. So um, I guess that's also like a benefit with the fiber intake as well, like you are having more water. Um, so as well, the method of having warm water, um, I personally can't say I've tried that, but um, it's also maybe could be due to the having an extra glass of water or having more fluids. Yeah. Yeah, trying to have um, lots with medication in the morning and then another glass of water. So, yeah, following it up with the water. Um, do we have any last minute questions? Um, otherwise, we might finish a little bit early. Um, I don't know, Penne, if you could post in the chat the evaluation form for today and just a little bit more about HCCA if you're wanting some more information. Um, but yeah, we can send through some links a little bit later as well. Um, some more information about how to get in contact with the students if you are wanting some advice. Um, but yeah, a really, a really, really big thank you um, to Min, Michelle, Hannah, Nicole and Amelia for jumping in today. Um, this was a really, really great presentation and I definitely learned some things and we'll be applying those tips. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much to um, to you for your support. And um, I know the students have really enjoyed working, working with you and um, yeah, all the support you've provided. So thanks for that.